the entry level point for Hyundai's broadening SUV lineup is this car, the Bayon. It takes established engineering from the brand's i20 Super Mini and delivers it with the trendier crossover vibe that customers for small cars increasingly want. Plus, there's also the advantage of a more sophisticated and more spacious cabin than you'd get with a conventional small hatch. This is a much copied formula, of course, but this high end deed delivers it with value and a class leading warranty. Set off in this Bion, and the first thing that you notice is that everything's so light and easy to use, primarily the electric steering, but also if you've opted for manual transmission, the clutch and the gear shift action too. Uh, a DCT 7-speed automatic is optional. Either way, the transmission has to be mated to Hyundai's usual 1-litre TGDI petrol engine. It's available with either 100 PS or, as in this case, with 120 PS. Uh, this is a willing little three-cylinder unit which goes about its business with plenty of pulling power and a cheerful three-cylinder thrum. Uh, but to be frank, the benefits of the 48-volt mild hybrid technology are difficult to discern, uh, both on the move and on the balance sheet. The WLTP returns you get from this engine in both its forms, 53.3 mpg and up to 119 grams per kilometre, aren't that much better than the readings you get in this class from non-electrified rivals. And quite a few of the gains that are being delivered here uh, may actually be coming from the clever IMT, Intelligent Manual Transmission Setup, which uh, decouples the engine from the gearbox after the driver releases the accelerator and allows the car to coast for greater efficiency. Predictably, the Bion's most at home in town, thanks to the light steering and the easy manoeuvrability, although you'll feel uh, harsher speed humps and tarmac tears. Uh, beyond the city limits, uh, speed through the turns, that steering rack doesn't uh, really communicate back much of what's happening beneath the front wheels, but the slight firmness in the car's ride quality and the excellent body control still might encourage you to throw the thing about a bit if you were to be running late for your gym session or for the school pickup. Highway refinement is pretty well judged, although the little three-cylinder engine's characteristically vibrant soundtrack will be very evident should uh, short notice overtakes be required. For those, you'll have to have selected the most dynamic of the three available drive modes, which is Sport. Uh, there are two others available, Normal and Eco. Eye-catching design is a key component of modern Hyundai models. If you doubt that, then go and look at an Ionic 5. Now, stylist Luke Donkervolka hasn't had quite as much fun here as he had with that car, but this Bion is still quite a striking looking thing with all its slashes, angles and attitude. Uh, the frontal face is defined by these independently positioned upper daytime running lights rather than the uh, arrow shaped three part headlights, which combine with the side air intakes. And from the side, well, this may theoretically be the smallest SUV in the company's range, but it's still 4.2 metres long. These dimensions are disguised by all manner of slashing and creasing to distract the eye. Uh, notably, this dynamic shoulder line, which creates the wedge-shaped profile, uh, the angular lines above the rear wheel arch, and the arrow-shaped C-pillar. We think the rear section is perhaps this car's most pleasing perspective. Arrow-shaped LED lights connected by a thin horizontal line. Time to see how adventurous Hyundai's been with design inside the cabin. Now, at first glance, there's not as much to catch the eye as there was outside when you greeted the car on first acquaintance, but start to look around. And this cabin, which is described by Hyundai as a modern digital interior, might start to grow on you, uh, providing, of course, your expectations come aligned with this uh, Bion's relatively affordable asking fee. It's certainly very digital. Uh, you might not expect to get a configurable, full-width instrument display included at this price point. And the level of provided central screen media connectivity also sets the segment standard. Uh, everything is uh, borrowed directly from the brand's i20 Super Mini. That includes the seating position, which, although it is a fraction higher, it's certainly not SUV-like. You might also have hoped for uh, something a bit trendier than this rather dour, dark, hard plastic interior trim, but it is solidly fashioned, and there are a few interesting touches. Uh, the weirdly spoked steering wheel, for example, the smart cross-hatched seat trim, and the serrated flashing around the door catches too. 
Cabin practicality is reasonable. Uh, there's a big glove box and there are properly sized cup holders here next to this thankfully manual handbrake. Right, time to take a seat in the rear. Now the doors open nice and wide. And once inside, you'll find that this Hyundai has as much space for legs and knees in the back as you could reasonably expect in the class. Headroom isn't quite so noteworthy thanks to that tapering rear roof line, but you'd need to be over six feet tall to have a real problem. And the relatively wide exterior width and the low central transmission tunnel here means that it is reasonably realistic to take a trio of passengers back here if you absolutely had to, although this raised uh, central cushion won't do a great deal for the comfort of the middle occupant. Let's finish this section with a look at the boot. Uh, lift the hatch and you're greeted with one of the more accommodating areas in the segment, uh, 411 litres in size, that's 37 litres more than the Kona, and 59 litres more than you'll get with the i20 Super Mini this car's based on. Now one day, makers of small SUVs will offer the flexibility of either a ski hatch or a 40-20-40 seatback split, but that day hasn't yet come, so there's just this conventional 60-40 split backrest, which lowers to reveal a 1,205 litre total capacity. Overall, the Bion manages to make good use of its super mini underpinnings and engineering while remaining very much its own car. We'd certainly expect it to outsell the i20 model it's based on. Uh, there's just enough design flair here to satisfy this SUV's fashion orientated target audience and to keep pace with an increasingly talented set of rivals. Whether all that will be sufficient for long-term success in this rapidly evolving segment It'll be interesting to see.
So what's it like to drive? Easy in a word, well, easy providing you get used to the fact that with the manual model that most will want, you'll have to have both the clutch and the brake pedal pressed and the gear lever in neutral before the engine will fire, which is a bit of a faff. But the little one litre TGDI petrol unit you have to have here springs into life with a cheerful three cylinder thrum, eager to be away. As in the Hyundai i20 Super Mini that this car shares all its engineering with, uh, everything is super light and easy to use, primarily the electric steering, but also if you've opted for this stick shift, uh, the clutch and gear shift action too. The engineering here though is hardly light on technology. We'll brief you on the 48 volt mild hybrid tech in a minute, but even before getting to that, there are drive features here that are generally forward thinking in the class. This, for example, is the first Hyundai SUV to come with rev matching. That's a feature that's usually reserved for really high performance models. And this synchronizes the engine to the output shaft, allowing for smoother and sportier gear shifts from a manual gearbox, which is really rather clever. Uh, this IMT setup has a neat fly-by-wire clutch that disengages drive to save fuel when you come off the throttle at cruising speeds. That's a trick usually reserved for automatics. Dad the accelerator again and drive is instantly and seamlessly re-engaged. All of which means you can make better use of that electrified engine tech. As mentioned earlier, it's based here around just one single 998cc three-cylinder petrol power plant. Uh, although you can have that unit in a choice of offerings, 100 PS or, as in this case, 120 PS. Either way, with the option of 7 DCT automatic transmission if you want that. Uh, we'd like to have seen Hyundai also offer the full hybrid 1.6 litre unit it provides on its alternative Kona SUV, which allows independent drive purely on battery power and therefore much greater gains in efficiency. This mild hybrid power plant can't do anything like that. Uh, the 48 volt tech gives it a fraction more mid-range throttle response. It's happy to pull from just 1200 RPM when you're driving slowly. And the start-stop system cuts in a bit earlier at urban speeds. Uh, that's about it though. Still, Hyundai wants to convince you that this technology is making a discernible difference here. And to that end, they've provided a selectable energy flow screen in the instrument cluster so you can see exactly how the system's working. Now, we mentioned a couple of outputs for the one litre TGDI unit. Nearly all Bion folk are going to be happy with this engine in its base 100 PS form. Uh, now that in manual form makes 62 from rest in 10.7 seconds on the way to 113 miles an hour. It's 11.7 seconds and 112 miles an hour for the auto. Opting for this unit in its uprated 120 PS state of tune, uh, the one we have here, makes virtually no discernible difference to the performance of the manual model. Uh, the 62 miles an hour sprint is reduced in time by 3 tenths to 10.4 seconds, but uh, it takes over a second off the time of the auto. It reduces it to 10.4 seconds. As in most TMD models these days, drive modes are standard, but unlike the Kona, they're not accompanied by multicolored changes on the digital supervision cluster in front of you. Uh, Eco is the default every time you start off, which is a bit annoying because it rather unhelpfully desensitizes the accelerator pedal until you remember to change that setting into one that responds a bit faster, sport mode particularly so. All these settings really do is to alter throttle response and steering feel, although with the seven speed DCT auto, that affect gear shift timings too. Refinement at cruising speeds is pretty well judged, although it's not quite up to the standard set in this class by say a Volkswagen T-Cross or a Peugeot 2008. Move on to fast secondary roads and this little three cylinder engine's characteristically vibrant soundtrack is a bit more evident and this, together with the slightly firm ride and the well judged body control, might encourage you to throw the thing about a bit uh, were you to be running late for your gym session or for the school pickup. Uh, the car certainly changes direction quickly at speed and it clings on tenaciously through the tight turns. Unfortunately though, the rather lifeless steering rack fails to communicate back 
much of what's happening beneath the front wheels and that slight firmness to the ride quality is really unwelcome when you return to the city limits and encounter the usual speed bumps and tarmac tears. What Hyundai's engineers still need to learn is the art of producing a small SUV with a ride and handling balance better suited for all kinds of roads. Uh, the kind of benchmark that's currently set in the segment by the Ford Puma and the Nissan Duke. In suburbia, where the light steering comes into its own for easy manoeuvring, you might initially need to adjust to the feel of the way that this car decelerates and brakes itself. Uh, there is a marked slowing when you come off the throttle as the mild hybrid systems generator works against the falling engine revs to create electricity and the pedal needs a firm prod if it's going to generate instant retardation. But this is something you quickly adjust to in a car that demands little of you and delivers more in terms of drive dynamics than you might expect. A narrow Audi-like bonnet uh, sits above the brand badge and the main radiator, while down below, the lower air intake has a silver frame to confirm this model's SUV identity. Hyundai hasn't gone overboard with the wheel sizes. They start at 15 inches and they range up to the 17 inch rims we have here. You have to stretch to this top spec level of trim to get this trendy two-tone roof, which comes with black finished door mirrors to complete the effect. Uh, these reversing lights and reflectors are a bit exposed lower down here at the corners but there is a neat roof spoiler and the silver lower underplate to remind your friends about the kind of car you've chosen. Underneath it all sits uh, Hyundai's K2 platform that's borrowed from the i20 Super Mini which sired this car. Uh, the two models also roll down the same production line in Izmit, Turkey. Now the first thing that you're probably going to notice once you get comfortable is the central infotainment screen which flows out of the instrument binnacle positioned at the top of the dash right in your line of sight, particularly if you happen to have avoided entry level trim and got it in this 10.25 inch touchscreen navigation form. There is a smaller and less sophisticated 8 inch monitor with base trim. As usual with Hyundai monitors of this sort, there are clear, neat graphics and helpfully large lower shortcut buttons, although we would ideally have liked to have seen uh, the brand incorporate the kind of useful lower iDrive style controller by the gear stick that you would get an arrival Mazda CX-30. There are two main menu pages for this bigger touchscreen, a one simple uncluttered one with temperature, audio and navigation, or you can swipe across uh, to a display full of icons, all of which can be moved about uh, to your preference, rather like the home screen on your smartphone. Either way, you'll have the expected navigation, phone and media options, plus a six-speaker DAB audio system, with the usual Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone projection. Although curiously, the latter phone mirroring system is only wireless with the smaller monitor used with base SE Connect trim. Uh, there is also a climate section, although fortunately that's not at the expense of physical buttons. Those are provided uh, further down this center stack. Uh, the screen climate menu adds useful auto dehumidify and auto defog functions. Hyundai is also keen that you should know that this monitor incorporates their latest Blue Link connected car services, 
Uh, these provide live information and also control of the car via an app. You can access various Blue Link options via this display too. Uh, there's a calendar, weather reports, and also info on vehicle diagnostics, plus uh, incorporated Hyundai Live services, which alert you to speed cameras and provide accurate information on traffic jams and roadworks. We're not so keen on the voice recognition setup here, which can't manage something as basic as finding your favorite radio station. There are though some really nice extra screen touches we do like, an icon which allows you to record voice memos, for example. So if you think of something when you're driving along that you don't want to forget, uh, you don't have to reach for your phone or stop and write it down. The second of the two new facial screens we mentioned earlier is slightly less sophisticated. Uh, Hyundai calls the 10.25 inch LCD display you view through this four spoke steering wheel here its digital cluster and it's certainly better than the digital binnacle setup that you get in the larger i30. Uh, you get two virtual dials which change in colour depending on the drive mode selected. And unlike the digital instrument binnacle, which is available in the rival Volkswagen Group small SUVs, you don't get a full screen width GPS map viewing option. The only bit of this display that you really can configure is a central part that's customizable in three sections via steering wheel buttons. You can show navigation arrows or a compass. There's a drive assist menu with speed limit info, uh, camera safety stuff, and an attention level indicator too, showing you when you took your last break. Or there's an alternative car menu, which offers the choice of an energy flow monitor to show how the mild hybrid system's working, or a digital speedo, uh, trip computer data, or a rather pointless display that shows how long the stop-start system has been operational for. At the bottom of the monitor, uh, there's a theoretically useful, although in practice slightly distracting band that shows your ever-changing level of current economy. What else? Uh, well, it's worth mentioning that with top spec ultimate trim, you can lift this rather dark cabin ambiance with a two-tone dash option, which has the fascia's lower section finished in light gray. Unfortunately, that can't be optioned in with the variants that most customers are more likely to choose. The seats offer reasonable lower back and side support and uh, achieving a reasonable level of comfort is fairly easy. That's thanks to plenty of cushion and wheel adjustment. We'd prefer a backrest adjustment wheel rather than this lower lever though and the option of lumbar support. Uh, disappointingly, you can't have that even with this top spec model. All round visibility is good. Uh, thin A pillars give you a wide view at junctions while the relatively low belt line and little quarter windows set into the rear C-pillars help your vision at the rear. And just in case, rear sensors and a reversing camera uh, both come as standard across the range. But this camera has a particularly neat extra option which allows you to view the ground directly as you reverse um, if you're worried that you might be just about to run over something. Build quality, as usual with Hyundai, is excellent and the various fittings seem to have been well screwed together by the Turkish factory. Uh, that slightly makes up for the fact that a lot of the cabin fittings here feel cheap, especially the door handles and the door bins. Uh, you don't necessarily expect soft touch plastics in a small SUV, although some rivals are beginning to offer them, but most competitors do a better job than this of disguising hard, brittle surfaces. Still, at least there's no uh, piano black trim to get all scratched up and covered with dog hairs. A deep storage box is positioned further back between the seats here, but this lacks the connectivity ports, which would allow you to charge up your smartphone inside away from prying eyes. Those ports sit above this deep backlit well at the base of the center stack. Uh, you get a 12 volt socket plus a couple of USB A points. Uh, the door bins are of a reasonable size and you have angled bottle holders, plus you get a ticker clip in the driver's sun visor.
only Volkswagen's T-Cross, Skoda's Kamiq and Seat Sirona match it in this regard. And there's more space than you get in either a Ford Puma or a Citroen C3 Aircross. And popular contenders in this sector like Nissan's Duke and Vauxhall's Crossland are noticeably more cramped. What else? Well, it's a bit mean of Hyundai to only offer a seat back pocket on the front passenger side. There's only one grab handle coat hook too. Still, the door pockets are reasonably large. They'll take a 500ml bottle and useful touches include a provided USB-A port below this central cubby and little side slots to put your belt buckle in when they're not in use. To give you some perspective, that's about the same as is offered by a Vauxhall Crosland, but 45 litres less than you'll get in a Ford Puma or a Volkswagen T-Cross. Five carry-on suitcases will fit in here. To give you some more segment perspective, a Citroen C3 Aircross will take six, a Skoda Kamiq seven, and a Ford Puma eight. Still, there'd be no problem taking something like a baby buggy in here because this trunk area itself is broad, deep, and well-shaped. We also like the way that a channel is provided, which enables the parcel shelf to be slid vertically behind the rear seat back when it's not in use. There's a boot light, a bag hook, and four tie-down points in what Hyundai calls its luggage board. This is supposed to be an adjustable height boot floor, but it seems to have been designed uh, without much thought for the fact that unlike other mild hybrid SUVs, this Bion puts its system battery in the spare wheel well beneath the floor, which not only uh, prevents you from having a spare wheel at all, but it also impedes the movement of this luggage board uh, downwards. As you'd expect, the pricing here conforms to the current segment standard for small SUVs of this type. At the time of this test in autumn 2021, it kicked off from just over £20,000 and ran up to just over £25,000. There are three trim levels, base SE Connect, mid-range premium and this top ultimate spec. All off of this Bion's core one litre TGDI 48 volt turbo petrol engine in 100 PS form with a DCT auto gearbox available for an extra £1,250. Avoid baseline trim and your dealer will offer you the opportunity to find £750 more for the one litre mild hybrid power plant in the uprated 120 PS state of tune that we're trying here. Unless you happen to be familiar with Hyundai product development, you might really wonder why the Korean brand feels the need to offer this car at all, given that it already has a well-established small SUV, the Kona, which uses exactly the same one-litre mild hybrid engine and costs almost exactly the same as this Bayon in baseline trim. The company's plan, though, is in future to move the Kona slightly up market. For the time being, though, the Bion's task is simply to offer something a bit different in the showroom for the increasing number of customers who are looking for a small SUV. People who might notice that it offers a useful advantage over the Kona when it comes to boot space. The Kona counters uh, with a wider engine range, which includes the full hybrid and the full electric powertrains that you can't have here. So ultimately, it depends what you want in your small SUV. A sector which continues to grow and grow. So how does buy-on pricing stack up against the other alternatives that you'll be considering in this class? Well, there are certainly cheaper choices, including this car's almost identically engineered Hyundai Motor Group cousin, the Kia Stonic. That would save you around £1,500 at the bottom end of the range, as was the Nissan Duke. 
and the Citroen C3 Aircross could theoretically save you up to £3,000, although that price gap would narrow considerably if you match that car's spec to this Hyundai standard. Even cheaper class options include the MG ZS, the Dacia Sandero Stepway and the Sangyong Tivoli, but with those three, you rather get what you don't pay for. Now, Sangyong does also offer its rather more capable Corando model, and that's priced from around £20,000. Other segment rivals, though, are much more comparably priced to buy on levels. Uh, you'll pay a similar amount for a comparably powerful Renault Capture, Vauxhall Crossland or Fiat 500X. Ford Puma pricing starts at buy on levels too, although they get a 125 PS engine fitted right across the range rather than having to pay more for that level of output. Uh, you'll need to think in terms of having to find around £1,000 more than is necessary for a base buy-on if you're going to opt for a comparably powerful version of a key rival like Volkswagen's T-Cross, uh, Skoda's Kamiq, say it's Arona, uh, the Suzuki Vitara or Peugeot's 2008 and think around £23,000 for the cheapest versions of Jeep's Renegade, a Mazda CX-30 and the Mini Countryman which is about the same amount as you'd need for a Toyota Yaris Cross or a Honda Jazz Crossstar, although those last two models are both full hybrids. If, when you've finished looking at price and product comparisons, you're still tempted by what this Hyundai has to offer, then you'll want to know exactly what's going to be included for your money. Well, a pretty reasonable amount as it happens. Even entry-level SE Connect variants get 16-inch alloy wheels, uh, automatic headlamps with high beam assist, rear parking sensors, a rear view camera, cruise control with a speed limiter, a perimeter alarm, and also some significant electronic camera-driven safety features. Now we'll cover those off for you in a few minutes. Inside with SE Connect spec, the big ticket item here is the 10.25 inch digital supervision cluster instrument binnacle screen with its virtual dials. Plus there's air conditioning, drive mode select driving modes, a leather stitch steering wheel and an adjustable height luggage board for the boot. Uh, infotainment is taken care of by an 8 inch center dash touchscreen display uh, and that also has Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Uh, plus there's Bluetooth, voice recognition and the DAB audio system with a pair of speakers front and rear along with two tweeters. If you want a bit more in terms of equipment, you'll be encouraged to find the £2,200 premium that Hyundai wants, which will upgrade you to premium trim. Uh, that gets you lots of extra niceties, of course, larger 17-inch alloy wheels, full LED MFR headlamps, LED rear combination tail lamps, rear privacy glass, uh, power folding door mirrors and auto wipers. Inside, premium spec models get heated front seats, dual zone air conditioning, a heated steering wheel, interior mood lighting and a useful auto defog system which more quickly clears the windscreen on misty days. The key upgrade you get with premium spec though lies with cabin screen tech. The centre console screen grows to 10.25 inches in size, it gains navigation, cloud-based natural language voice recognition and a full suite of Hyundai's Blue Link telematics services with a five-year subscription. You can access the various Blue Link options via the central display. There's a calendar, uh, weather reports and info on vehicle diagnostics. You get a voice memo option too and the screen's incorporated Hyundai Live services which alert you to speed cameras and which provide accurate information on traffic jams and roadworks. Plus there's a downloadable Hyundai Blue Link app too uh, via which using a smartphone you can remotely lock or unlock the car and be advised if the alarm goes off. Using the app via your phone you can also access maintenance info on your buy-on, uh, send places of interest data to the car's navigation system and find the vehicle in a crowded car park if you've forgotten where you put it. If you favour luxury and find yourself with some budget flexibility, then you'll be directed to the fully tinseled up ultimate level spec we have here. This is the only model in the range fitted with the trendy contrast coloured black roof that fashionistas tend to want. And that's complemented in this case by a black glossy finish for the door mirrors. Plus there's a bit of extra camera safety tech that we'll cover off for you in just a moment. Inside, ultimate level spec uh, gives you a Bose premium sound system with a subwoofer, a wireless phone charging pad, keyless entry and the option of a two-tone half-light grey interior finish. 
Right, let's walk you through the Bion lineup and brief you on the key mainstream model equipment features. What about options? Well, as usual with Hyundai, there aren't that many. The brand believes instead that customers will prefer to move up a trim level rather than go box ticking. Uh, you can add some useful practical items though, like a liner for the boot area and floor mats of the velour or rubber kind. Bion branded entry guards are available too. Uh, for the few Bion customers who like the max power look, there are sports stripes available and you can add a rear bumper protector, a dog guard, a rear bike carrier and a tow bar. Of course, there are a wide range of optional metallic paint colors. We have intense blue here. You'll probably need to budget for one of these because the only standard shade is solid polar white. Now, annoyingly, you can't order the contrast colored roof as an option with SE Connect or premium trim. Let's finish with the perusal of the safety stuff on offer. Hyundai claims to offer what it calls the most comprehensive safety package in the segment. Closer inspection of the small print though reveals that as usual, the choicest elements only appear with the priciest trim levels. Still, all Bions meet the class standard in this regard, which means of course that an autonomous emergency braking system comes as standard front collision avoidance. It's the usual setup which, as you drive, scans the road ahead, searching for potential collision hazards. If one's detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond, or perhaps you aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. The other noteworthy standard fit camera driven feature is the lane departure warning system with lane keeping assist setup. It'll warn you if the car is unintentionally wandering over a road marking before gently steering your Bion back to where it ought to be. Uh, there's also driver attention warning and that monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness. And as I mentioned earlier, high beam assist, which automatically dips your headlights for you in the face of oncoming traffic at night. Other standard safety features are more familiar. There are twin front side and curtain airbags linked to an e-call emergency button system which will alert the rescue services with your exact GPS location if they go off in a crash. You also get ice-fix rear child seat fastenings and active front head restraints which prevent whiplash. In addition, uh, as usual with a small SUV of this kind, there's ESC, electronic stability control, tyre pressure monitoring and hill start assist control to stop the car rolling backwards as you pull away on inclines. As you'd also expect in this segment, the ABS anti-lock brakes are aided in panic stops by a brake assist feature plus an emergency stop signal which flashes the hazards to warn following motorists. If you want more, you'll have to stretch further up the range where ultimate spec further adds two additional camera driven features. Now first is blind spot collision warning, which works on the move to stop you from dangerously pulling out if there's a vehicle in your blind spot. Secondly, there's lane follow assist. Now here, smart sensors and the forward facing camera detect when the car drifts out of the center of its lane and applies steering torque to hold road positioning for safety. The car also estimates the trajectory of the vehicle ahead and adjusts its position accordingly. So it's all very reassuring. If you ultimately prioritize electrified powertrain technology in a small Hyundai SUV, then this isn't the one you'll be choosing. Uh, the brand's alternative Kona crossover can be had with the company's full hybrid and full electric technology, as well as with the company's 48 volt mild hybrid one litre TGDI petrol unit. Uh, that latter engine is the only one that's available to buy on customers. Uh, the mild hybrid tech lightly tinsels this 998cc power plant with a tiny lithium ion battery, which just about justifies the electrified hybrid marketing spiel. Now, unlike a self-charging full hybrid engine, uh, the sort of thing that you would get in this class with not only the Kona, uh, but also with uh, Toyota's Yaris Cross, mild hybrid engines are the sort of fitter to this Bion can't ever run independently on battery power. Instead, with this kind of setup, a belt-driven integrated starter generator replaces the standard alternator and enables the recovery and storage of energy that's usually lost during braking and coasting to charge the tiny 48-volt lithium-ion uh, air-cooled battery pack. 
The starter generator also acts as a motor uh, integrating with the engine and using the stored energy that it harvests to provide extra pulling power during normal driving and acceleration, as well as running the vehicle's electrical ancillaries and also helping the power plant's stop-start system in urban traffic. Measuring the difference that all this makes to fuel and CO2 readings is difficult, uh, but based on our experience with similar mild hybrid tech in other models, a number of this Hyundai's uh, competitors do also now offer it. We've put the efficiency gains at between 3 and 4%. Uh, that's the kind of improvement that the brand itself claims has been achieved here. And that means we can classify the benefit as marginal, but worth having. Uh, you want to know, though, how that pans out in terms of the actual figures that you'll be budgeting with and being taxed on. Well, for this one litre TGDI unit, you're looking at up to 53.3 mpg on the combined cycle. That's about 2 mpg less than you get with a comparable i20 Super Mini. And up to 120 grams per kilometre of CO2, about 5 grams per kilometre less. Those returns, uh, quite impressively, being more or less identical, regardless of your choice between manual or automatic transmission, or 100 or 120 PS versions of the engine. Clearly those readings assume engagement of the most frugal eco-driving mode. For the mainstream 1-litre TGDI models, uh, the efficiency figures we've just quoted mean a typical 27% BIK taxation rate, although the higher spec DCT auto variants uh, stray up to the 28% bracket. Either way, there'll be a first-year VED tax bill of £165 for all buy-ons, with uh, £140 payable per year thereafter. What else might you need to know? Well, residual values. Now, they're a lot higher than they used to be on mainstream Hyundai models. Uh, the current i20 manages 46% uh, as a retained value after three years, and we wouldn't expect this, uh, the SUV version of that car to be much different. As usual with Hyundai, uh, a strong buying incentive is a five-year unlimited mileage warranty that comes as standard. And this is backed up by a breakdown cover which lasts for the same length of time and free annual vehicle health checks too over that duration. And our true rival brand Kia claims to better that package by offering a similar seven-year deal, but there you're limited to 100,000 miles. As for servicing, well, your buy-on will need a garage visit every year or 10,000 miles, whichever comes around first. If you want to budget ahead for routine maintenance, uh, there are various Hyundai Sense packages which offer fixed price servicing over two, three or five year periods. You can pay for your plan monthly and add MOTs into the three or five year plans at extra cost. Uh, the center screen's blue link section has a vehicle diagnostic screen which allows you to check in real time on steering, tires and the lane keeping assist system. The final financial consideration is insurance of course. Ratings have been set a fraction higher than some direct rivals and for some reason they're higher for the manual transmission than for the auto. Uh, the ratings start at group 13 or 14E for the 100 PS uh, 1 litre TGDI engine. For the 120 PS version of that unit the ratings range between 16E and 18A.